My concern, I've, I've been dealing in, in the greenhouse industry for many, many years, and I see this very inefficient use of space because we grow on one horizontal plane in the greenhouse, but we heat the entire cubic space. So first became an energy concern. How do we conserve this energy? And the simplest way was to go vertical. And then as, as the system has evolved, by going vertical, I can minimize water usage. And in the system that you, you know, saw here, uh, we use 1 20th the amount of water that is used in conventional agriculture, which nowadays is becoming a very big issue. So we recycle everything that doesn't go directly into the plant, goes back into the system. Uh, the, the other thing is, as we, this energy thing comes along, we are importing so much of our food. It comes from all over the world, and it's like if you live in New York, your lettuce is coming from Southern California. We're flying at 2,000 miles or something. It just, it's not going to work. We've got to go back to urban agriculture where you, you are consuming food that is grown locally. Unfortunately, all of the farmland we've built on, so there's no farmland left to grow it on. So it's finding a way to do intensive agriculture that is renewable and sustainable in an urban environment. I can have it on top of a building in New York. I can have it in the desert in Las Vegas. I can have it out in the desert in Dubai. I can have it uh, in a building. Uh, I can have it in a basement by adding supplemental light. Uh, <laughs> I can grow it anywhere. I can put it in the Arctic, okay? I can put it anywhere you want it. And it can produce large quantities of quality material. Potatoes, carrots, beets. Uh, about the only thing that, that we would be limited on are large grain crops like wheat or corn, something like that. Uh, we're working on a rice project right now where we can grow rice in the system. Uh, we have strawberries, uh, herbs of all varieties, lettuce, uh, spinach. Uh, the, the crop list just goes on and on and on year-round production because we're in a controlled environment and the controlled environment offers us a number of other advantages one we can exclude pests so we have to use no pesticides to control insects on this material uh, of course because of the way it's grown uh, we don't have any weed crops I mean weeds get in so we have no pesticides uh, the filtration system includes UV sterilization so when the nutrients in the water are applied they're completely clean so we've eliminated that risk of E. coli contamination that we saw last year uh, where, you know, I think five people died during that process. So that's one of the things we're trying to get to is very clean, locally grown crops that are very healthy for you. On the subject of biofuels, corn reigns supreme in terms of garnering media attention and coverage. There's also soy as well as palm-based biofuels, mostly biodiesel, that follow closely behind. But there's another alternative that's out there algae. It's been bubbling up on the internet and on the lips of academics and researchers as well, but so far it's received scant media attention. Well, today I'm talking with CEO and principal scientist of Valsin, Glenn Kurtz, about his vertigro system that harnesses and utilizes the power of algae to produce vast amounts of biofuels. So thanks for joining us today, Glenn. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me this morning. I think a lot of people out there are scratching their heads or they're interested or maybe they're a bit questioning of algae-based biofuels. You know, everybody's heard about corn ethanol. Uh, some people are aware of soy and palm-based biodiesel, but you're taking a different route, and you're talking about producing not only biofuels, but other products from algae. You know? Right. I was going to ask you, you know, pretend that, you know, I'm a 13-year-old. Okay. I don't necessarily know all that much about science, but I'm interested. Explain to me what you're doing about algae, why it's so important, and what your company is doing. Well, algae is one of the oldest plants on the planet. Uh, most of the stuff that we work with are considered microalgae, so they're very, very small. Uh, it is the green stuff that you find in your pools and your aquariums. Uh, but what most people don't realize is the fact that uh, there are a lot of species of algae that during their growth process uh, produce a lot of lipids. And basically the lipids are vegetable oil, and they produce it at a very high volume. Uh, it's why algae is important in the food chain because it's one of the key keystone species uh, for perpetuating aquatic ecosystems because it starts out as the primary food source. Uh, it's the fastest growing plant on the planet. 
and it gobbles up more CO2 than any other plant on the planet. So there's a whole host of reasons for wanting to work with this particular uh, organism. Absolutely. And now why, why did you go for algae? Why didn't you start with corn and maybe move up to, to algae? Or why did you even focus on you know, the lipids? Why, what's so special about the lipids? That well, the, the, the vegetable oil that comes out of the, the lipids uh, from the, the algae uh, is ideally suited for the production of biofuels, uh, a wide range of them from jet fuel to uh, what you would run a, a car or a truck on. Uh, the beauty of algae is the fact that based on the, the species that I'm growing, I have some control over what the carbon chain length that's coming out of, of that oil is. So if I want something that's in the, the short carbon chain length, uh, I grow one species. If I want something that's got long carbon chains, I grow a different species. Now, in reading through your company's literature on Valsen's website, I came across where you're talking about the algae research and development lab that you have recently yes. opened and that is pretty groundbreaking in terms of screening these different strains of algae to try to find ones that ideally suit certain applications, whether you're trying to grow algae for biofuels or whether you're trying to grow them for you know, dyes or Pharmaceuticals, food. cosmetics. Um, we set up what we consider to be one of the, the finest algae research laboratories on the planet. Uh, in that lab, we have developed a high screen, uh, high throughput screening process uh, which allows us to do literally tens of thousands of tests to determine the absolute uh, parameters from uh, nutritional values to what the chemical compounds coming out of that species are. And we can do that in a three- to four-week period, where traditionally that would take nine to 12 months to screen. Right. And now something that interests me as well is uh, in most biofuels production systems, in the agricultural sense, what we're talking about is monocropping. Huge fields of corn of one species or right. huge fields of soy of one species, which you know, the organic movement and sort of progressive agriculture is somewhat at odds with. But in your system, what you're studying is the combination of numerous strains of well, algae. We, we, can do, we can do a monoculture, but one of the things of great interest to us is getting away from that uh, approach and looking where we can have multiple species growing because they form symbiotic relationships with each other. Uh, they support each other. Uh, as a quick example, we can have a blue-green algae growing in the system with other green algae. The blue-green will actually take atmospheric nitrogen, fix it into a nitrate that is usable as a food source by the, the green algae, uh, which eliminates us having to add nutrients. Right, which cuts the capital costs, exactly. cuts the inputs, which means you don't have to keep have entering a, into the system. And we have a healthier system. Right, and you have a healthier system, a somewhat more natural system, right. even though it is closed, even though it is... You know, somewhat artificial, you know, you have the solution of water, algae, right. and you're bubbling carbon dioxide through it, is that correct? Well, actually, we bubble atmospheric, just air. We bubble mass quantities of air through. Excellent. And as you know, there's, there's a lot of carbon dioxide in air right now. That's what's causing a <laughs> lot of the problems, okay? Uh, we do use a little bit of supplemental uh, CO2 on occasions, uh, more for pH control uh, than anything else in the system as a buffer. But uh, the bulk of the CO2 is actually coming out of the atmosphere. So more often than not, in the systems that you're studying and you are planning on building, there are very few inputs to put in there. It's largely once you build it, once you set up your system, you're not having to truck in all these nutrients. You're not having to we, find we a do, source we of do use it. We do use some, but we, we try to limit that as much as we can. And because we're a closed-loop system, uh, it's like with water. Uh, uh, we're very good at conserving water in the system. Uh, first of all, it's closed-loop, so we lose nothing to evaporation. And the only water that we actually lose in the, the processing of this is what gets chemically bound into the, the body of the algae and in the uh, oil itself. Right. So everything else goes back into the system. Now, something that is of interest are the actual statistics. Everybody likes to hash out the statistics, the differences between what these systems are capable of achieving right. in terms of yield, how much they cost, are they economically viable. I was wondering whether you might speak about that first in talking about what you are hoping to yield. And I think the basic measurement is an acre per year uh, right. of, in this system. How much are you expecting to yield well, from you, an acre? You asked me earlier about you know, why, why algae over corn or soybean or something. Uh, if I grow an acre of corn uh, over a year, everything I, everything I can do on this, this uh, corn field for a year, uh, and I harvest it and I squeeze it out for oil, I might get 25 to 28 gallons of oil. Mm -hmm. uh, if I go up to palm, okay, if I have the same acre of land and I'm growing palm, I might get six to 700 gallons 
of oil per acre per year. With algae, we're somewhere between 20,000 and 100,000 gallons of oil per acre per year. Which is incredible. Those are big numbers. Big, big numbers. It's a huge difference. Big difference. Well, one of the things you have to look at, uh, how long does it take a corn plant to grow? Right. Okay? Algae will reproduce itself, depending on the species I'm working with, uh, every 24 hours. Okay, and some species as much as six times a day. Right, which is incredible. It means a new generation, a new every, multiplication exactly. of cells. Every, you know, uh, it can be as high as six times a day. It's the fastest growing plant on the planet. Which is one reason why everything else, throw everything else out of the conversation, that is one of the main reasons. That's one of the main reasons. To look at algae. And, and the, the nice thing about it is the fact that, uh, you know, I, I'll be honest, I got started in this uh, looking at methods for sequestering carbon dioxide. Because 90% of the weight of this algae, when we dry it, take the water out, is sequestered carbon dioxide. So here's the fastest method uh, on the planet naturally existing to sequester carbon dioxide is algae. And in the process, you're also producing